coming to you live from the Mediaplex in downtown Windsor. This is a presentation of St. Clair College Journalism. Hi, I'm Shelby Hernandez and you're watching Mediaplex News Now. The axe-wielding woman who allegedly held up a convenience store in East Windsor has been arrested. Police were called to Fred's Variety Spot on the corner of Reginald and Westminster around 8.30 Friday night. The store owner, who was not working at the time, says she is a regular customer who came in to purchase cat food just the day before. After threatening the employee, who does not wish to be named with an axe, she left the store with a small amount of cash and two packs of cigarettes. I don't know. I never expect that. To be honest with you, I never expect she's going to do that. She's going to rob the store with an axe. Members of the Windsor Symphony Orchestra participated in an event that combined all kinds of art to create something new. Aaron Sanders reports. You could be an artist at any genre, sports, entertainment, you can name pretty much anything out the book. But what if you mixed the art of music and, well, art together? You got yourself a nice event. The equation of a music bow plus a paintbrush equals an event called bow and brush. Capitol Theatre hosted the event as musicians from the Windsor Symphony Orchestra provided classical music. Simultaneously, Ontario and French artists Von Benetto and Nadine Murray created a painting in real time with the music. The artists have done a live painting before at a live gallery. They said the difference in performing at Capitol Theatre was the additional classical music. Murray says the instruments represents color. When, when the uh, cello plays, pour moi c'est plutôt du noir, it's, du it's more for me uh, black, maroon. Quand le, vie, le violon, le when violon the joue, les violin sont plays, plus aigus, et pour it's moi, more comme... sharp. The artist says their inspiration contributed to the finished work. The artwork portrayed a bass player with onlooking, disembodied heads. The instrument is, is just about the, the extension of the body. Uh, des musiciens. Uh, musicians like us, our paintbrushes are an extension of our hand. During the performance, a silent auction was held for the feature painting in progress. When the show finished, the painting's bid went from a starting bid of $50 to the final price of $600. The money will go towards various music programs around Windsor. Impressive work of art. An event like this will happen again on March 22nd. There over there is when the art of music and creation of the canvas will collide together yet again at Capitol Theatre. Speaking of, reporting from the Capitol Theatre, I'm Aaron Sanders for MNN, Mediaplex News Now. Jonathan Martin is outside at the corner of University and Victoria, and all I have to say is, better him than me. Jonathan? Thank you, Shelby. Well, I certainly don't have to tell anyone who's been outside just how cold it has been out here. In fact, it's so cold that a cold weather alert has been issued by the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. That's because overnight we're expecting our temperatures to dip down to minus 15. Now I'll let you know what the rest of your week is going to look like in just a few minutes, but until then, back to you, Shelby, in the studio. Thanks, Jonathan. The Windsor water world will be around for another year at least. Evan Mathias has a story. Windsor councillors voted to keep Windsor Waterworld open, despite administration's recommendation to close the facility to save money. How much money would Windsor save? The uh, estimate was uh, approximately $315,000 for a full year. So if it uh, stays open for half a year, it would be half of that, which would be 157000 or so. While Council's decision to keep Waterworld open will cost the city money, they managed to stay within the budget and not increase the overall tax levy. I'm here at Waterworld. In behind me is the pool which has been closed for over a year now. The rest of the facilities at this location do remain open like the gymnasium and meeting rooms for different activity groups until June when the city has decided to close down the facility for good. Those programs include fitness classes as well as after school programs for kids which were important to Ward 2 councillor John Elliott, no matter the fiscal cost. It's sometimes not about the dollars, it's about the kids. That What's it doing? Keeping them off the street out of trouble. You know, and then all of a sudden you close it up, 
where the kids have the go. Nowhere. Now they're in the streets, now they're in trouble. What the property will be redeveloped into once Waterworld is closed is still under discussion, according to Colucci. But there is a possibility on the table. Uh, uh, some discussions going on with the uh, school board, uh, you know, that, so there's that potential. If the school board is the path for redevelopment, Elliot says he wants to make sure there is a plan in place to keep the after-school programs running. Let's work with the school board and, and having something where there's an after-school portion for those kids. Talk, let's talk to the school. Let's do it now, you know, so we're, we're planning. While the decision has been made for Waterworld, its location will remain a topic for counselors for the coming months. Reporting for Mediaplex News Now, I'm Evan Mathias. City Council voted unanimously to keep the ice rink at 80 Knox open for at least one more year. But as Chris May reports, the rink isn't completely safe. The ice on the ground isn't the only ice that's been on Windsorites' minds lately. Administration are recommending that the ice rink at 80 Knox be closed to help the city budget. In the end, city councillors voted to keep the rink open after a large group of community members voiced their concerns. Time to sit down at tables and start planning long term. Because in the short term, we're in trouble. We've already seen it. According to Ward 2 Councillor John Elliott, one citizen gathered over 2,100 signatures for a petition to keep the rink open. He also said services like 80 Knocks are grassroots programs that help lead kids toward a better future. If you're not careful, you'll lose some good kids. They'll fall through the gaps. They'll fall through the cracks because, you know, we decided that we're going to take a program away from them f about money. The city would have saved $100,000 if they closed the rink for the full year, according to Chief Financial Officer Honorio Colucci. That was able to be um, fit within the existing uh, tax levy, so it will, will not cause an increase in the total tax levy. The discussion of closing the rink was brought to the table after city administration made the recommendation based on money and efficiency. The downtown mission will be raising funds with an event this week. Sean Frame tells us more. On January 29th, the St. Clair Center for the Arts will be hosting a pasta lunch. Tickets are $8 and all proceeds support the hungry and the homeless at the downtown mission. Director of Programs and Services, Dino Salvador, tells us more. From uh, 11 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon, so I believe it's an all-you-can-eat pasta. So, uh, I believe that, again, some of the portions from the money raised will uh, come to benefit us here at the Downtown Mission for, uh, for us to continue to um, help with uh, some of the program and services that we offer here at the Downtown Mission. I'm Sean Frame, Mediaplex News Now. Josh Olson is the owner of the Beer Exchange, and he sits down with Cassie Malinowski on this edition of 3 Minutes With. Hi, I'm Cassandra Malinowski, and today I'm sitting down with Josh Olson, the owner of the Windsor Beer Exchange. And thanks for being here, Josh. Hello, thank you. So, what was your idea behind creating the Beer Exchange? Um, basically, the initial idea behind the bar in general is just, uh, I try to take all my favorite Windsor bars, take all the elements I loved of them, and make it into something the city needed, something the city wanted, and, uh, the exchange part was kind of uh, an idea that came from the states that Canada didn't have yet. The fluctuating prices, it, it wasn't legal a couple years back, so I thought I'd try to be the first person in Canada, essentially, to bring that idea to Canada as more or less a marketing gimmick, but also something, I don't know, something that took off, I guess. I what bars were you trying to like bring in together as one, your favorite bars? I was a really big fan of the whole loop complex back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, Dominion House, A-Bars, they all had elements I loved and that was pretty much it. That's great. And you were recently nominated in the Windsor Independent, the best of 2014, and you won the best beer selection and came in second for best music venue. How did that make you feel when you found out? I feel pretty good. I uh, put a lot of work into the beer especially. I try to get newest beers possible, beers have never been to Windsor before. And uh, as far as music goes, it's something I've always been into. I've been booking shows since I was 14 years old at different uh, community centers around the city, different bars, and uh, thought I'd do it for myself. But I, you know, I'm glad people are recognizing it. That's great. What is you say? What would you say the most um, popular beer selection is at your at your bar? 
No, nah, nothing really goes more than anything else. Like uh, Walker Village's hometown beer that always goes well. But I, I rotate so much. Uh, there's ten taps on the main level, and I try to rotate those in and out as fast as possible. Have as many beers on tap as possible. And, Trying to uh, always keep it interesting. I guess uh, more than anything, Windsor's got an amazing art scene, got amazing music scene that I think this Windsor takes for granted for the most part. So I'm, I'm trying to get people more involved, like everyone more involved. Like if I book a show, I always try to get three or four bands that have never played together to kind of bring the whole scene together. It's mm -hmm. more, you yeah. uh, know. What would you say sets your bar apart from other bars in Windsor? We looked at other bars' menus and we were trying to stay away from every all the bar cliches every bar menu we looked at was essentially exactly the same mm -hmm. and we get criticized for that we don't have chicken wings and stuff like that people want a certain thing when they go to a bar but we try to stay away from that that's norm, great you know. yeah well thank you very much for talking with me today i really appreciate that thank you and this has been your three minutes with joss olson the owner of the windsor bear exchange i'm Cassandra malinowski thank you for watching now it's time to take another look at the weather outside with Jonathan Martin. Jonathan? Well, it may be cold here, but it could be worse. We could be Boston. As of this afternoon, they received 21 inches of snow. Here in Windsor, though, Wednesday, it's looking like it's going to be mostly sunny with a high of minus 4 and a low of minus 11. Thursday, we're going to get a little bit of snow, but we'll have a high of 1 and a low of minus 5. And Friday, it'll be mostly sunny with a high of minus 8 and a low of minus 11. From the corner of University in Victoria, I'm Jonathan Martin. Stay warm, everyone. Back to you in the studio, Shelby. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a new year, but we have brought back one of our favorite segments, British Bee, with our UK correspondent, Sean Preble. Welcome back to England and to Gillian Kent for the first 2015 edition of the Mediaplex British Beat. I'm Sean Preble, and I thought with the Super Bowl only days away, I'd find out what people think about this big event here in the UK. So let's take a look. When did you first start getting interested in the uh, Super Bowl? Um, I kind of follow NFL casually since about 2007. Uh, I'm a big sports fan and it's on, it's on TV on Sunday nights when there's not a lot of sport on. So I just kind of started watching it through that. And then yeah, been, been, been staying up for the Super Bowl for about six years now. Um, from like a re uh, reasonably young age, because uh, I go to Florida every year. So uh, I've been seeing like, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when I go there since about the age of 10. So yeah, it's about just under 10 years now. I just like started watching it once, kind of liked it picked up a team and yeah, just went from there. What is it about the Super Bowl that uh, differs from sports here in the UK? Uh, yeah, it's like the, the spectacle halftime show is really what a lot of people watch it for. Like, a lot of people actually watch the Super Bowl just for the halftime show. Um, whereas like rugby, football over here, is literally people go to watch it for the game, not to, not for the spectacle. Well, it's very different because, I mean, there's been a lot more coverage over the last few years compared to um, five, ten years ago. But obviously it's still like kind of a niche sport and um, so even though now they have games in Wembley and everything the excitement is not quite the same as it would be in the US I suppose. It's different, it's the whole spectacle, it's about much more than just the game as it is the halftime show and cheerleaders and everything. I think it's less, in that sense it's more entertainment than sport, there's kind of more of a focus on the event rather than it being kind of this climax of the sporting season. Who will you be rooting for in the Super Bowl this Sunday? Well, the Patriots, of course, because of the Patriots <laughs> fans, so, yeah. Uh, well, as I said, like, the, the Bucks, because I've seen them quite a few times, and also uh, I'm quite a big fan of the Miami Dolphins, because I've seen them quite a few times. Uh, I, I like the San Diego Chargers um, for my sins, because of uh, the Daniel Tomlinson. He was just my favourite player I started watching, so I'm a Chargers fan. Now I'm going to head into Cooper's, the on-campus pub here at the universities at Medway to find out a bit more about the Super Bowl party that they recently started last year. How did the uh, whole Super Bowl party get started? Um, a few customers were asking us if we were going to be screening it um, and manager and supervisors here kind of thought it would be a great opportunity to have a new night at Cooper's, make it a bit of a bigger thing over here um, and the students really enjoyed it. So. And how many, uh, how many would you say you're kind of maybe expecting for uh, this upcoming party? 
Um, I'd say between 50 and 100. It was absolutely packed in here last year when we did it. So, yeah, it, it, it should be a really busy night. So how popular would you say um, uh, something like the Super Bowl is here in the UK? Uh, I didn't really know much of it until a few years ago. And then, obviously, last year when we started it here, uh, it, it, it's more popular than I thought it was. Um, obviously not as popular as it is in America, maybe, but it is still quite popular here. Thanks for tuning in to the first 2015 edition of the Mediaplex British Beat. I hope everyone enjoys the Super Bowl, and I will see you again next week. But for now, back to the Mediaplex. A local plant is looking to house some of its workers on site. Chris Jackman has the story. Tecumseh's biggest employer could see some new residents this year. The Bondwell plant is seeking permission from the town council to house as many as 60 migrant workers on site at the plant. The, the decision point for us as council is will these workers live on site at the plant where there wouldn't be a transportation cost and they'd be near the park and the st stores or will they live off site uh, in, in, in other uh, homes or other places. The council is planning a public meeting on the matter for some time in February. For Mediaplex News, I'm Chris Jackman. Some stores in Leamington have been closing their doors for good. Matt Recker explains. Driving down the main streets of Leamington, you may notice some of the city's most famous landmarks, the Tomato and the Heinz factory. But one women's clothing store on Talbot Road East may not catch your eye as quickly. Clyde Hatch at Ease may not be as well known as other landmarks, but it's been doing business for more than 90 years. That is, until recently. Clyde Hatch's owner, Dean Short, has announced that they have to close their doors for good and end their near century of business. It hurt me because I, I, I love the town and I love the, um, I love the store. The store is beautiful, um, but the traffic just was not, the people weren't coming downtown. Clyde Hatch at Ease isn't the only business forced to close up shop in recent years. Giants like Zeller's and Heinz are gone, but also smaller shops like Mordrigal and Little Treasures. According to Short, the key to a store's longevity in a small town is to be unique. You have to be different than other people. You can't bring, just bring in something that, like Clyde Hatch is different. It's, it's an upper end store, so anybody that wanted nicer merchandise would go to Clyde Hatch. Clyde Hatch opened on Talbot Street, seen here in 1920. The First World War had just ended, William Mackenzie King was Prime Minister, and gasoline cost 30 cents a gallon. But the closing of the Leamington landmark does not mean dark times are ahead. New businesses are flourishing, like the barely one-year-old ATO Gaming on Mill Street. The shop's owner, Chris Smith, says Clyde Hatch's closing does worry him, but only slightly. It does and it doesn't. They've been here for 90 years. You don't know if they've been, you know, it's time for retirement or anything like that. Uh, it can also worry a little bit because the economy, you don't know how much it's going to rebound back. This is the second card shop Smith has opened in the last eight years, and he has his own advice for those looking to open a new business. Really, you've got to focus on what your market's going to consist of. Uh, make sure you get a lot of advertising out there, and then just hopefully everybody comes in. You know, cater to the customer, and everything should be okay. We have a group of first-year students who are all about sports, so they have revived Sports Talk. What's up, sports fans? I'm Michael Hugel. And I'm Bird Bouchard. And this is your Mediaplex Sports Talk. A big weekend in local basketball as both the St. Clair Saints and Windsor Lancers took to the hard court. And Bird, we're gonna start with the Saints. Thanks, Mike. The women came out victorious over Redeemer by a score of 90 to 68. Shannon Kennedy netted 19 points in the Saints' victory as they went on to score 33 points off 27 Royal turnovers. The men, however, weren't so lucky as they were edged out 78 to 75. They were led by Stephen Gray and his team high 16 points. Catholic Central graduate Siobhan Gale added 10 points and 6 steals in the loss. St. Clair will start a four-game road trip with the Humber Hawks this Saturday. The University of Windsor Lancers men's basketball team captured an upset win over the nation's second-ranked Carlton Ravens, 74-71. Rotimi Osentula Jr. celebrated his win after at Tim's I with his double-double. He, he went on to gather 16 rebounds and 22 points. A big night for the Holy Names graduate not to be outdone was Brighton, Ontario's NCAA transfer Mitch Farrell scoring six consecutive points in the fourth quarter to secure the victory. 
U of W will be back in action to celebrate Breast Cancer Awareness Day this Saturday at the St. Dennis Center. For Bird Bouchard, I'm Michael Hugel, passing it back to Shelby at the desk. Thanks, guys. A young local athlete is gaining national attention. Sean Garrity has the story. I'm TJ Laramie. I'm 17 years old, fighting out of MTC in Windsor, Ontario. Fighting to me is a place where I feel like I can control everything that goes on around me. I feel safe and it, truly at peace in the ring. Uh, really during a fight, like, I don't, I never show emotions really too much during a fight because emotions will get the better of your technique and like everything else. You're angry, you get a lot more like tired. Uh, Really, like, I'm pretty blank-minded when I'm in there. I'm just, uh, it's a lot of reaction. You know, I'm listening to my corner, say any tips they got, like, while I'm fighting, if they say, like, oh, throw a right hand, or he's open for this, you know? I'm listening to that kind of stuff, but other than that, I'm pretty deaf, you know? And my mind's, like, just a white chalkboard. I'm almost never tired than the, more tired than the other guy, you know what I mean? So I, I know I'm in control of the fight through, from the beginning to the end. I know I'm in control. I'm winning every way possible. I've never really been in a situation where I've been like down and I have to come back, really. I've been, uh, usually I know how to pace myself throughout a match, so I'm not really ever tired. But if that situation ever occurred where I was beat and tired in the fourth round, all I'm thinking about is two more rounds to go, you know? Just take it round by round, just try to win every round. You're at that point where you want to give up and you, you have to go farther. That's the difference between an average athlete and a great athlete. In five years, hopefully I'll be holding a UFC belt somewhere. St. Clair College's Media Convergence program allows students to produce stories like the ones you see here. Take a look. Journalism enables people to be well informed. It's documenting history. It's an extraordinary way for people to be connected with their community. What happens in the world affects us. What happens in our community affects us. What happens in the province affects us. And we get to be the eyes and ears and tell the stories. There are many stories that need to be told and those things add value to our life. I'm always meeting new people. Uh, I'm learning about things that interest me like topics that I want to learn more about. It's neat to know that so many people are relying on me. It makes you strive for perfection or it makes you strive for accuracy. The journalism program here at St. Clair College is a convergence journalism program. Convergence means the merging together of print, radio and television and the web and putting all different stories into three or four different platforms. In 21st century newsrooms, Journalists have to be able to do it all. We ask every one of our uh, reporters to uh, tell stories in multiple ways. There's a different style of writing for print than there is for radio, than there is for television. And it's really important that um, the information gets out that is true to those platforms. We are one of the few, if not the only, uh, program that is actually taking students to a live broadcast and giving them that opportunity and that experience. I've gained a lot of self-confidence. I used to be a really nervous person, a really shy person, but I think this program's helped me come out of my shell. It's given me something that I love to do and that's made me a better person. I find that the students that come out of St. Clair College are already at or above where some of our uh, broadcast um, employees have been uh, over the last several years. I feel that I made the the greatest decision I could two years ago by choosing this program because I have learned so much and I think that I can only um, grow from here. I would hands down recommend the program to someone considering it. I would recommend it to someone that's not even considering it. They teach you such a vast array of different skills, different platforms, different things that you could really apply to so many different careers. Based on literally hundreds of interns I've seen over the years, St. Clair students are better prepared to go into the work environment in media. 
than most students coming out of colleges and universities across North America. I think it's that very comprehensive curriculum that we have that creates converged journalists that sets this journalism school apart. Are you considering post-secondary options? If so, make sure to check out St. Clair College. Times are changing, and they're changing faster than most people can understand. It's not my parents' generation anymore, and I can't just go by their ideas because it's not necessarily relevant anymore. There's a jobless generation out there walking out of universities with no idea how to engage their industry. A degree isn't necessarily a pathway to their career. Being industry ready is. I have to take control of my future. The job market has changed and I have to adapt. I'm not just getting theory, I'm getting skills. Through placement, I'm shown which areas I can specialize in and which path it takes to get there. I struggled a lot in high school because, I mean, people just kept lecturing at me and I, that's just not my way of learning. I learn by doing. I learn by um, reacting to a situation. St. Clair puts me directly into my industry. I'm dealing with real patients, real life situations. It's not just theory, it's not book work anymore. I think it's so important to be taught by industry professionals because they know what they're doing and they're not just teaching because they read it in a book somewhere. They're teaching because they've lived it. I got that genuine feeling from St. Clair, like it was just home. Like I wasn't uncomfortable, I wasn't uneasy, it just, it felt nice. I have to take control of my future, and that's what I'm doing. I got a gut feeling with St. Clair that was great, and I definitely wasn't let down. St. Clair is my choice, and I'm glad it's the right one for me. I choose to take control of my future, and my path is St. Clair College. I choose. I choose. I choose. I, 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 I choose to take control of my future. My path is St. Clair College. I choose to be here. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Shelby Hernandez, and you've been watching Mediaplex News Now. Mediaplex News Now is a production of the St. Clair College Journalism Program.